fresh 20 pound note. In one of my slides, there was a sea otter, okay, a sea otter. And if you see it, shout out, I see a sea otter, and you get 20 quid, right? And that is going to be there. And I'm the first person to shout that, 20, 20 pounds, right? Statistics in GIS is what I've been doing in my career since 1990, which is probably before a lot of you were eating solid food, right? Some of you, you most of you were probably born, but a lot of you were you know, two and three, I know. There was no World Wide Web then. There was no open source, which was a term coined in 1998. There was not a lot of GIS, and there was no GIS that could really do statistics to the extent that we wanted to do it. And what I was doing in 1992, we had, I was working at the Regional Research Laboratory in Lancaster. We had licenses for ARC Info, which was version three and then version four. And I wanted to get some graphics so I could do some plots of, you know, scatter plots of XY data, histograms, things like that. Have you seen the otter yet? No. Um, I, we wanted to do graphs like that because you can't do statistics without plotting your data, first of all. And there was a graphics package called Uniras, which ran on our Solaris workstations because we didn't have PCs then. There was no Windows that was at all usable. I think we had one PC in the corner attached to a digitizer because it needed a serial port and our Solaris workstations couldn't do that. So that we, I was using Uniras to do graphics and I was trying to link it into our info and that involved writing Fortran. And I'm, I'm wondering if this is going to win a prize for the oldest code at PhosphorG. I didn't write this. This is just old code. This is how you got Fortran to draw things in those days. You had to set graphics limits and then read your data in and scale it and plot it. And you got a graph out like that. And I wanted to find some way of getting data out of ArcInfo from the database component of, of ArcInfo and plotting it like this. And that was kind of horrible. And I, I gave up. Um, we had a statistics package called S+, which was a proprietary statistics software, and I wanted to link that to ArcInfo so I could get the data out of ArcInfo, feed it into S+, and do my graphics and my statistics in S+, and then maybe feed the results back into ArcInfo so I could map it using the derived uh, the statistics that we computed in S+. So this kind of pipeline backwards and forwards, and I used something actually called a Unix pipe, which some of you might know if you use Linux and Unix, very nice kind of two-way interface between two packages, uh, and that involved writing ArcInfo AML. Now, this is my entry for my code for the oldest code at Phosphor G. This was 1993, I think I wrote this. This is the old macro language programming system that ArcInfo version 3s and 4s had. They got rid of it eventually. It might even still be in there. I don't know. I haven't used ArcInfo. It's still there. It's still there. Oh, I haven't used it for years. I will never use it again. But you wrote this, this macro language stuff, and somewhere down here it runs S plus, S plus then attaches the data that something that was written earlier and then it tries to do a plot in S plus and then read the data back in. Really messy and I gave up. Um, so we, we, we attach, attack the problem from the other direction. Let's, instead of trying to get statistics into the GIS, let's put GIS into the statistics package. So I wrote this spatial point pattern analysis package for S+. Point pattern analysis is when you've got a set of dots that have come up for some reason. There might be cases of a disease. And you want to know, is that a cluster? Are there more people getting the disease next to the power station, this kind of thing? So I wrote a package, an add-on for S+, called Splanks, uh, spatial point pattern analysis code in S+. Conveniently also has Lanks in it, which is uh, where I'm from, Lancaster University. Um, and other people started writing other add-on packages to do spatial data analysis for S+. And so there was a, a few things built. And, but there was no real internet at this well, There was internet. There was no real World Wide Web, so communication and, and transfer of these packages. We used to sell Splanks for £60 on floppy disk. Um, we made a bit of money. I don't know where it went. Uh, and, and other things, uh, a guy this morning was talking about using Kriging to do interpolation of, of geostatistical data. There were some Kriging packages for S+. But S+, was still proprietary based on a, uh, a language called S, which had been commercialized into this package S+. Uh, some guys got fed up with that, so they re-implemented uh, re the S language and called it R. This was, they started in 93. After about five or six years, it was nice and usable. And all the code that was written for S plus was migrated to R. And the whole community started to build on that. And we started writing even more spatial packages. So we've got things like GOR that reads, um, that does creeing. 
and we've got SPATSTAT, which does point pattern analysis better than I could ever do, because this was written by an absolute genius in Perth. And then we've got links to some of the open C and C++ libraries, like GEOS and GDAL, Google, GDAL, and there are wrappers to that. So you can do the kind of things you can do in GEOS, polygon overlay, uh, nearest neighbors, all that kind of stuff. You can do all that in R, it's fantastic. And RGDAL lets you do data transfer, and there's patches for rasters and, and everything. It's, it's brilliant. So R is now a GIS. Here's some fantastic maps uh, from James Cheshire, uh, his lovely global migration, and this map of population change in London over the years. And these are all done in R. So uh, this, this is better than anything we ever did in ARC Info in 1993 by about a million, million miles. Um, and I picked up some other maps on the web from various other people. There's some lovely galleries of maps in R. This guy, Oscar Pepignon Lamiguero. Uh, this is some kind of four colored, showing four variables on one map. And this is a map of uh, snow, urban land, forest cover. Uh, with, you know, you've got your cartographic axes and scale bars and compasses and all that kind of GIS-y stuff that you, you can now do that all in R. You don't need anything. So job done. Right, great. We've done statistics. <laughs> Sorry? That's a river otter. <laughs> yeah, hopeless. That's, that's a lutra lutra European river otter. It's not only the hydra lutra, the, the, the sea otter, which is a completely different genus. You're not even the right species there. Okay. <laughs> we've done statistics. We've done GIS. We've done statistics and GIS. We've linked the two. Fantastic. Job done. What can we do now? Right, let's... Let's do proper science and GIS. Um, what's proper science? Well, I'm wearing my t-shirt. Okay, that's my Software Sustainability Institute t-shirt. I am, this year, a fellow of the Software Sustainability Institute, which is a, a UK Research Council funded project to get better research through better software. And one of the things they promote is this idea of reproducible research which, as well as the idea that science should be reproducible anyway, otherwise it's alchemy or magic, uh, the idea, it, it makes it easier for the researcher to redo their research when they realize there's been a mistake or the data is different or you've got new data sets and you want to redo your process. So it's the idea of, of mechanizing a research process, which is much easier to do with a programming language than with a point and click piece of software. And one of the tools I use for doing this is a thing called Knitter. It's an R package uh, written by this uh, uh, Chinese student who's now over in the US working with some guys over there. The idea of Knitter is you, write, you can write a text document written using markdown format, which means this is my heading, this is my subheading, and then this chunk here is a piece of R code, so a bit of R programming code. This just reads in a data file and draws a histogram, and then I write a little summary saying that was the mean and that was the variance. And I process that using Knitter, and it comes out as a PDF document, if I want that, which shows my code, shows my histogram. Then the boss comes along, and I get, I get the minimum variance down there. The boss comes on and says, oh, the data was wrong. Here's the new data set. And I just do one line of command, and I get a new histogram, and I get the mean variance, and I print that out and say, there's my report. And that saves masses of time. The way that NITA works is my little simplified diagram. It takes your original document, it splits it up into things that are plain text, which is my description of the problem, and chunks of code, another chunk of text, another chunk of code. It then processes those code chunks, and any output that comes from those code chunks, which can be graphics, gets included in the final output along with the text. So you end up with a final report, which is completely derived and defined by your document and your data, and uh, because your code is inside your document, your code. And that's a completely reproducible piece of research, and journals are now starting to take this kind of thing as publishable uh, property. Um, so what I wanted to do was to be able to use QGIS to try and use QGIS's cartographic features and maybe some of its analysis functions in Knitter. So I've got beautiful maps that QGIS can make in Knitter. Now, it, by linking it with R. So I can combine my statistical analysis in R with QGIS's maps. So I want to write a chunk which it might read in some data, some woodland, a map of woodland. This is an R function to read in some shapefiles. Uh, do some analysis, magic, and produce a new 
data file, uh, and then write that out to another shape file, and then call some magic function which takes a QGIS project and produces a map. Um, and I want to get something like this. This is my MISA document. I write a little bit of code, and then after doing analysis, we get this, and this is produced by QGIS, uh, which you can tell because it's got a scale and everything, and uh, looks like a bit of uh, QGIS output. Um, well, the first approach I took was to think that NITA doesn't just let you put chunks of R code in there, you can put chunks of Python code, shell script, other programming languages. So this was what I thought, I could make, I could have chunks of Python code and use the QGIS Python programming API to produce my plots. So I wrote a little uh, Python package called QMapping and I can embed a chunk inside my NITA document which just says import QMapping, so this is Python code now, it's not R, and then QMapping dot make PNG from shapefile with a shapefile and a PNG, and that would, uh, there's some startup code for starting up QGIS at the start, and that would just dump out a, a PNG file which I then included into my uh, document like this, and that kind of works. I get that come out quite nicely. Um, but unfortunately, it's, it's, um, there's some restrictions on that API of QGIS. You can't put plugin layers in. Uh, it doesn't, so you can't have nice open street map backgrounds or the stamen watercolor backgrounds. The API doesn't handle the print composer, so you can't do a nice fancy thing with all sorts of legends and logos and zooms and things. You have to have one Python process per chunk of code, which means it can be a bit too slow. It's, it seems unnecessary to me. Uh, you hear the guy who wrote Nitter is working on some interprocess communication so that you can start one, pro one Python process at the start and have it all talk. Um, and R can, can kind of do these maps itself, so, so why are we bothering? Um, I don't know. I, I had another idea. I thought maybe we could use the QGIS server, which is a web mapping server implementation, and I could get R to now ask QGIS for the maps. So the idea behind QGIS server is it renders your QGIS proje project files just as QGIS would, except it doesn't because, again, it doesn't render plugin layers. Oh, by the way, you, you missed the sea otter. S-E-A-O-T-T-E-R. It's safe. <laughs> OK. Um, so the QGIS server didn't really work. So I thought, let, I've got to have full control over QGIS. So can we control a running QGIS to do exactly what we want with it? And I figured out a way to do it via a Python web server. Python's fantastic. In about three lines of code, you can have a web server running and you can, you can write some more code to tell it what to do when it gets requests. So I wrote a QGIS plugin, which had this kind of at its core, which just opens a web server on port 80, listens for requests, and handles those requests. And this handler code, you write to do what you want it to do. So the problem is now just, can we write a handler? And I wrote a handler that just, if you went to port 8080 slash PNG, just gave you a, a flat PNG file, just basically grabbed it from a running QGIS, said, oi, give me that graphic that you're currently displaying, grabs it, returns it as a PNG, and this is just in a web browser. Um, and I wrote another handler that gets the, um, the composition, which is QGIS's uh, sort of map composer type thing with legends and what have you. The idea being that someone who isn't au fait with R could just set up a nice layout in QGIS, and then the R programmer can write their fancy stuff that computes uh, where the woodland is and all that kind of stuff, and get that back into their document. Um, so that was my plan of attack. One person creates the project template, R does all the other hard stuff, and this PNG goes backwards and forwards, which R then sticks in the report, and you end up with a reproducible report. And I got some results, okay? I'm flagging. Um, I am after last night, really. Um, so this is a QGIS project map because this is this is how you can do uh, graticules in QGIS, and this is a QGIS legend. And the styling there of that map is all done by QGIS, but the data has come from R squirted through a shapefile, and it comes back by a PNG. But it was just a bit flaky. I couldn't get the axes right. It was cropping it the wrong way, and. I wasn't sure if this was at all possible. It might just be because I was using QGIS 1.8 and I need to get 
2.0 running, something like that. I'm not sure. So I think I'm probably doing something wrong. Um, but I really didn't have enough time, so I give up. And, and I'd love to talk to some QGIS guys about this and, and try and get it working. Uh, but I'm thinking that R's power for doing graphics is, is so beyond uh, a lot of what you can do, even with the new QGIS styling and the new QGIS features that you would have might have heard about at the, uh, the QGIS talks yesterday. I don't know, I wasn't there. I need to talk to the QGIS guys. Um, I, I, I think you, c you can do a lot in R. Some of the, the lovely color overlays that you can do in QGIS now look really nice. You can't do that in R. You can only kind of do opacity, but QGIS has this nice blending, these layer blending things that you can do, which looks really pretty. Uh, and I'd like to be able to do those. Um, so my little summary, I, I've done this so you don't have to. I don't know why this was built as a newbie talk in the in the uh, in the program because I, I, there's a lot of code and stuff in there. Stephen asked me if there were any curly brackets in my talk today because he was going to go. Is he here? I, I didn't. T I told him there weren't any curly brackets, and he's gone anyway. Um, so I've done this so you don't have to, unless you want to really have a go. I'll. I might try and scrape some of this code together. It was all real, a real hack I did in a week. Uh, three or four weeks ago, just so I had a, I set aside a week to try and work on this. Um, we can make pretty maps in R with OSM backgrounds and, and all that lovely cartographic stuff, um, such as this. This is all a dozen lines of R code. It looks as pretty as things you can get out of QGIS, and you've got full control because you've got a programming language <coughs> behind it, and you can make these into reproducible reports, which you can print off, and the data changes, and you just run them again, and off they come. Uh, no point in click rubbish. Another mad idea I had was to write a web feature server in R so QGIS could then read the data directly from a running R process. And I wrote kind of half of it, and it was that. Um, but maybe, maybe next, maybe I'll see you in Portland, and I'll tell you about writing WFSs in R. But that's, that's another story for next time, which I hope you'll all enjoy. <laughs> I heard a voice, I think someone over here, someone over here, who is it? We have a winner. Go on. As long as you give it to Map Action for a Map Tender t shirt, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm finishing early, this is great. Or is that five minutes for talks? That's five minutes to go. Five minutes to go. Okay, so I think this is this is where Mark stands up and says questions. Yes. Questions. Yeah. I was the odd one out claiming to be a st statistician yesterday, so I had a kind of statistician question for you it's instead of this QGIS thing. Um, why did you choose Nita instead of Sweeve or the usual old stuff we, we use? Uh, Sweeve is very much uh, old and busted, whereas Nita is the new hotness. Uh, there's a lot of uh, awkward things in, in Sweeve. It can't do uh, lattice, grid and lattice graphics and, and ggplot which is all very nice. Without a bit of fiddling, you have to put a print statement around it and mess around with it. And it's, a, it's much more regular syntax for the, the chunks. Um, uh, there's some minuses in that you couldn't, until recently, do uh, vignettes in your package using Nitter. You had to use Sweeve. So the documentation for packages had to be done with Sweeve, but now you can do that with Nitter. Uh, it's, it's just so much nicer. I've been doing some uh, statistics in uh, QGIS together with Python. Uh, is there any reason that I should move from Python to R? Uh, I get a lot of flack on the R mailing list because I love Python. Um, whenever there's, there's questions about uh, our syntax, I say Python does it so much nicer. If, if the only thing that R has going for it is 
about 4,000 packages for doing statistical analyses on the R archive. And if the analysis that you want to do is in the R archive, then don't bother trying to re-implement it in Python just yet. Use the use the R code. But if if and that's why I would I would do my analysis in R. It's just because there is such a wealth of R analyses that are there and done. And if people start implementing that in Python, if, it, if all of the R archive was was re-implemented in Python, I would leave R instantly because it's a horrible language. Um, so if you're implementing new things in Python, great. But if you need to use implemented things that are implemented in R, then you might want to look at some of the Python R connections like uh, RPy. Have you seen that? And uh, Python R, yeah. So that's my reason for the la my language choice. So I don't know what yours is. Thank you. OK. It's uh, just about uh, OpenStreetMap layer. Uh, why did, didn't you use the uh, GDAL to uh, WMS driver to use OpenStreetMap as background? D to use which, sorry? GDAL driver. GDAL driver. Um, and to a WMS server or something. Yeah. And GDAL driver, WMS driver, give you the ability to have uh, OpenStreetMap layers, Google layers. Um, uh, as a raster layer instead of uh, open layers plugins? I'm not sure which, in, in R? You can use it in uh, QGIS mm -hmm. server. Um, ah, yeah, 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 because WMS isn't a plugin in, yeah. No, it's just a setup driver. Yeah, I, th I and think. It, it, QGIS consider it as a raster layer. Yeah. And it's come from OpenStreetMap yeah, instead I'd of uh, the plugins. Yeah, I might, I might have played with that at some point before I hit that point. <laughs> okay, let's uh, have a round of applause.